Thank you everyone for being patient today as we're starting this just a little bit late, but we recommend that uh, you share this as well with your friends because this is a special session on a special day. Today, for all of you who are wondering, is the celebration of the birth of Baha'u'llah. All the Baha'is around the world are celebrating this wondrous occasion, these twin birthdays of the Bab yesterday and Baha'u'llah today, prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. Now, we have with us Mr. Shabbos Fathi Azam, who has uh, a big contribution to give us today, and we're very uh we're looking forward to that, but first, let me give some uh, introductions. So today's topic is humanitas, images of perfection. In the figure of Abdul Baha, we can look to the world outside and follow a living, historical, perfect exemplar. This most perfect bounty sent down in the form of a human being. Images of perfection distilled in one man. We can observe and marvel at this orb of the beauty of the great. Abdulbaha embodied in both content and style, a unique conception of human excellence. While not free from the vulnerability of human lives to fortune, while not protected from the mutability of circumstance, while never distant from the existence of opposition and conflict in his commitments, while consistently challenged by the complexity, the indeterminacy, the sheer difficulty of actual human deliberation. His was a human story which, while sufficiently distant from our experience, counts as a shared extension of all of humanity's experience. Now, today's speaker, this week's presenter, Mr. Shahbaz Fathiazam. Shahbaz Fathiazam was born in India to Baha'i parents of Persian descent. He grew up in Haifa, studied in the United Kingdom, in Canada, and now he works in Brazil. From east to west, north to south, he considers himself as a marginal accident in all of the world's great regions and has lived along the entire axis of baby boomers. From generation X, Y, Z, and now Alpha, his grandchildren having been born since 2018, these challenges or rather urgent realities could only be met by being fluent in four plus languages and with a ready enthusiasm to embrace the unknown, including marriage to a clinical psychologist. His background in healthcare financial management gives him the tools necessary to survive. And his love for his cultures, religious history and literature domesticates his soul clamor. The law he most likes to identify with is that human value only functions when it is inconspicuously and intimately related to the religion of service. Now, in all his uh, humbleness as to his description, I would like to ask if you may, Shahbaz, uh, tell us, you've written a book, uh, I think a very important book. Could you please tell the audience the, the book that you spoke to me about uh, a few days ago, maybe a month ago, actually? Well, yes, uh... 2015, um, we published a book on um, the 50 years of the Universal House of Justice, and we called it The Last Refuge. Um, what was this book about? Well, it, it's, it's divided into two parts. As I say, it's, it's on bookstores in U.S. and elsewhere, Last Refuge. But uh, it's in two parts. It has personal considerations, a bit of personal glimpses of our years there, as well as formal considerations, which takes into account the legal aspects, the constitutional aspects of the house, its, its role, difficult to define still now, so green our religion is. But there we have it. So. I'm happy to say it's, it's going well. I mean, 5,000 so far sold. So I'm excited to bring people closer to the house. Yes. Very good. Very good. We're so happy that you could share that. And how can people uh, purchase this beautiful book by chance about the Universal House of Justice? I think if you go into Google, 
and just put in last refuge and my name, comes out a number of sites. Um, it is on PDF. So you have a version that's on PDF. And the German publication, um, German publisher, I think is still doing a second round of, of print. So yeah, just dot in last refuge, my name, it should come up and you have it. It's PDF and I hope you enjoyed it or enjoy it, yeah. So uh, I, have it, my, uh, I have it somewhere in my library, but to show you, but um, I won't take your time. Uh, in, in a moment, uh, Jeremiah is going to be uh, sharing his oh. screen for the PowerPoint. But just for everyone to see, this is the name of the book, The Last Refuge, 50 Years of the Ministry of the Universal House of Justice. Perfect, John. And uh, you can find this online. Um, this is not the website per se. I'm not sure. Is this, this is erfankulokia.org that it's posted on. Yeah, this is free. Your PDF is free. Beautiful, beautiful. And the Thank book is 10 euros, which comes okay. out, I don't know how many dollars, maybe 20. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. And, and Jeremiah, if you're ready. Um, well, we have a question actually from someone in the audience. Uh, uh, so I understand that your father, because uh, the name uh, Fafi Azam is very familiar. Uh, can you uh, elaborate? Uh, why is the name Fafi Azam so familiar? Okay, um, now you caught me. <laughs> well, you well, know, um, um, Yes, well, my father served at the World Center 40 years. So he was the first to be um, elected to the House of Justice in 1963. He wrote a wonderful book, The New Garden, which is also a familiar name, translated in over 100 languages, a simple, beautiful approach to the Baha'i faith. So the name circulates in this sense. Um, as well as publishing poetry, as well as doing other things and um, his services in India and adds to the annals of the faith. I mean, um, and he has a rich family history, you know, we can go back, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a short family story for you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So there you have it, everyone. You have uh, some exposure to this. Uh, his father has uh, also written a book, which you can take a look at. And he is a former member of the Universal House of Justice. And uh, I understand that your book, the, um, the, the book that we just mentioned prior, the first one about the refuge, uh, that is a book you made in consultation with your father, I understand, right? Well, um, it's a bit moving story. He didn't see it published. He died. He passed away in 2013, in August 2013. But I started writing 2012. So he got some bits and pieces of the manuscript. And he said, it's looking good. Keep, keep go ahead. Um, but he didn't see the final uh, final production, but the title is owed to him. Mm -hmm. I never forgot, I forget the day when I was stuck with a title and we were over breakfast table in Vancouver where he lived. He lived 10 years in Vancouver. And I said, dad, look, give me a title, please. And he didn't hesitate in a split second. He said, the last refuge just came out like a lightning because the word last refuge of a tottering civilization is a quotation by Shoghi Effendi on the house, you see, which is exactly that. In the dispensation of Bahá'u'lláh, Shoghi Effendi refers it to the house as the last refuge for a tottering civilization, which is a beautiful description. 
So it's the words of the guardian, but then the title was given to me by my father. So he has a role to play. And um, there we have it. Thank you, thank you. So we have in front of us a beautiful PowerPoint and display. Uh, Jeremiah, we're ready to go. And uh, um, Mr. Shahbaz, please, uh, uh, let, let's proceed. I believe there's an introduction music. And I think Jeremiah's got that going. I can't hear it though. To put us in the right mood. I see a big giant gray box on my screen. There we are, it's uh, fixing that. So um, there we are, there's a video. Okay.
Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Jeremiah, for this. Um, this was composed by a Roman Catholic priest of the 17th century, um, but he put to music, he was a priest and a composer, and he put to music a psalm. So, and part of the title in the next slide, you will see it, is a psalm, you see. Next. The original title of this talk is In God's Shadow, Abdu'l Baha and the Incarnation of the Ideal. So you see, I took the idea of God's shadow from this Old Testament. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's a beautiful analogy as well as statement. So we move on to these slides. Um, I hope you find it stimulating as I did as I was doing the research um, in preparation for the centenary of Abdul Baha's passing, an auspicious, auspicious date coming up in a few weeks. Next slide. Yeah, I looked a lot into the contemporaries, the people at that moment in time, at that Abdul Baha's years. Um, to capture as much as we can the space, the immediate circumstance of Abdul Baha and the world, you see. So that his story is really always a contemporary story. It will always travel through time. But I looked at these periods, and this quotation comes from a French philosopher a year almost to the date after Abdu'l Baha passed away. He was not a Baha'i, but it shows the mood of the time. And this is from Paul Valéry, Valéry on French, in French, when he addressed the University of Zurich in November 1922. And I read, we think of what has disappeared and we're almost destroyed by what has been destroyed. We do not know what will be born. We fear the future, not without reason. We hope vaguely, we dread precisely. Our fears are infinitely more precise than our hopes. We confess that the charm of life is behind us but doubt and disorder are in us and with us. There is no thinking man who can hope to dominate his anxiety to escape from this impression of darkness. But among all these injured things is the mind. It passes a mournful judgment on itself. It doubts itself profoundly. So it's showing the mood of the times. Nah? Um, at a moment of uncertainty in the world, the world was afraid, it was unsettled, it was incendiary. We'll see it through the slides, you see. A very difficult time. And this is the room where Abdul Baha passed away. Slide. Yeah, Abdul Baha's ministry was unique as it stood at the confluence of three, not one, not two, but three lost generations. Hearts torn, voices hoarse, with eyes so used to darkness that they had become unable to tell candlelight from sunlight. 
The first such lost generation, 1892, that were people who were born, for example, when Abdul Baha began his ministry, in their early 20s were sent off to World War I, you see. That's the first of the lost generations. Imagine, anyone who was born the day, the year Abdul Baha began his ministry, had a very short life, a hard life, because he had to go to the frontier and the First World War. This in battle cohort, was followed immediately by two more such lost generations. Interesting, huh? The first 10 years later, born 10 years later. And when they were in their productive years in their early 20s, in the first decades of the 20th century, they confronted hyperinflation in the world, mass unemployment revolutionary unrest and the instability of whatever had been left intact in Europe after four years of slaughter. Hyperinflation is different from inflation, friends. It's because inflation is always there. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon, but hyperinflation is a political phenomenon. It cannot occur without a fundamental malfunction of a country's political economy. So the second generation, a lost generation again, in Abdul Baha's ministry. And the last of the three lost generations was born again 10 years later, had the bitter choice of initiating the world with Nazi concentration camps, Spanish civil war, the Moscow trials, the latter of which set the stage for the great purges in Stalin's Union, Soviet Union. These three groups are close enough to form one weightless race of man in a wasted world that was supposed to house them. A weightlessness that condemned them to irrelevance. Very, very curious, this ministry of Abdul Baha coinciding with three lost generations. People seldom see that. Next slide. Ah, yeah, these are some of the slides that I read. Sorry, yes. Okay, good. And then we had the Treaty of Versailles, which people thought would be the end of wars. It was signed in Paris in the summer of 1919, a few years before Abdul Baha's passing. The treaty had set its eyes on the self-improvement of nations. But the self-interest of press-applauded, vengeful public figures was discreetly veiled by a facade of self-determination which in and of itself was untenable. Economic volatility was omnipresent. The ghost of multi-ethnic communities made national boundaries meaningless and empires hitherto bastions of stability had come apart. So again, you see, we have dwarf statesmen trying to solve the issues of the world in those years of Abdul Baha's last years of his life on earth. Empires hitherto bastions of stability for their hegemony had crumbled. Political systems, centuries in the building had come apart. Sometimes in a matter of days, the Tsarist empire was overtaken by communist republic the German authoritarian monarchy had become a parliamentary republic in nine days. The German empire had disappeared. The Austro-Hungarian empire had disappeared. Entangled with 10 different languages and its empire was broken. The Russian Ottoman empires were swallowed up. Amazing period. 
And how did Abdul Bahar respond to the peace treaty? Because he was alive. He, he, he was alive then. He was two years, the final years of his life, but he addressed the treaty. He said, look, although the representatives of various governments are assembled in Paris in order to lay the foundations of universal peace and thus bestow rest and comfort upon the world of humanity, yet misunderstanding among some individuals is still predominant and self-interest prevails. You see, he sensed that the statesmen were not very sincere. In such an atmosphere, he says, universal peace will not be practicable. Nay, rather fresh difficulties will arise. And it doesn't take much imagination to see what comes next, of course. But you see, Abdul Baha praises it, but then he also gives his doubts on the success of this. One member of the party who was present at the conference, and on Baha'i, a British Treasury principal representative, spoke of the other prime minister like this. He had one illusion, France, and one disillusion, mankind. So it's like a bunch of children trying to organize a peace treaty. Next slide. And a year later, Abdul Baha continues in prescient tone. In the future, another war, fiercer than the last, will assuredly break out. Verily, of this there is no doubt whatever. So we talked about the political scenes during surrounding Abdul Baha's last years. But now the social panorama, which we're going to address, like this photo Jeremiah chose, to address the text was the dehumanizing effects of poverty. The social panorama in Abdul Baha's latter years was also undergoing massive change. One eminent, eminent historian went as far as to label it as the age of catastrophe. So you see the text on the slide, the multiple consequences of injustice, institutionalized nature of class inequality were emerging as obsessions alongside the subtle nuances of accelerating technology and industrial advances. The proud display of international expositions, both sides of the Atlantic, the first man flight. These are achievements, you see. The moving assembly line it didn't exist until 1913. The motor car, the talkies, the movies, now, and so many other astonishing feats in the arts and sciences while transforming everyday life in both rich and poor countries brought in its wake burning political and moral questions of redistribution. Since then, since these years, you see, the problem of inequality and class system, the economics of inequality begins to grow very, very fast. And then you should all read very interesting book by Piketty, Capital in the 21st Century, where he explodes, exposes capitalism's central contradiction. Um, and here we have it. We have people, homeless people, getting worse ever since the days of Abdul Baha. Next slide. And it's ironic how aristocrats and capitalists, even socialists, were certain that things were going in the right direction. And then Abdul Baha looks into this problem of distorted economics and says a beautiful quotation, which we find in Foundations of World Unity, page 38. He says, each member of the body politic should live in most comfort and welfare because each individual member of humanity is a member of the body politic. And if one member be in distress or be afflicted with some disease, all other members must necessarily suffer. So the Baha'i viewpoint is this, that we cannot enjoy when one of us is suffering. Next slide. 
And he goes on, you see, that the, 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 the mankind is like one organism. If the eye is affected, the whole nervous system is affected. If one of our parts isn't functioning, the whole body is paralyzed, you see. So he goes on that the body politic, the world, becomes afflicted in reality from the standpoint of sympathetic connection. It's a beautiful juxtaposition of sympathetic connection like nervous, nerves. We have a big nervous system in the world, internet, for example. All will share that affliction since this one afflicted member will affect the others. It is impossible, he says, that we can stand by quietly when other members are ill at ease. And he ends the state statement saying, God has desired that in the body politic of humanity, each one shall enjoy perfect welfare and comfort. Next slide. Now, someone will say, well, this is sentimental utopia. But then I remember John Keynes, prominent uh, economist, writing something which stayed in my mind. He said, the ideas of economists and political philosophers are more powerful than is commonly understood. The world is ruled by little else. In other words, ideas bring change, my friends. Ideas are very powerful. How we execute those ideas is another matter, but I found it interesting that we can't go straight to our matrix of calculus without an idea, sovereign idea behind our spreadsheets. So the... So ideas are very important. And philosophy, of course, we're Baha'is, we're not philosophers, but the idea here, John Keynes is saying that, look at philosophy, what our philosophers have told us. He doesn't say religion, but then we can attribute from that that philosophy of religion also has something to say. Next slide. Yeah, man's material activities must be imbued with a sense of spiritual purpose and moral obligation. The idea is not new, but the Baha'i formulation is, given its emphasis on service to humanity. Next slide. And then we look at literature. So we've looked at the social, we've looked at political, we've looked at war. Here, the literature was very, very dark. The idea of decay, morbid fascination, um, trying to express comfort in an uncomfortable situation, all the while finding it hard to ignore the invective. And prose and poems, like the slide is saying, were written for the sake of the hopeless. Franz Kafka, for example. Hence the term Kafkaesque, meaning morbid, nah? something that is strange and demon-like. But anyway, it comes from him, you see, this Prague-born German-speaking novelist who died only a few years after Abu Baha's passing was considered by many a really German of, of, author no? of the 20th century, epitomizes this feeling of despair. And he writes, one of the first signs of the beginning of understanding is the wish to die. I mean, how morbid can you get, my friends? This life is unbearable, he continues, unattainable. One is no longer ashamed of wanting to die. Okay, next slide. Another famous point published a year before Abdu'l-Baha passed away, 1920, captured the mood of the, of the epoch. It was a frightening poem. It had to be because Yeats was 
surrounded by death, World War I, its terrible consequences. Um, the, Re the Russian Revolution had shook the world. The Irish Rebellion, he was Irish, you see. The Irish Rebellion for Independence for the British was crushed. It's sort of quite a tragic story. The Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-1919 had killed nearly 100 million people. We get nervous today that 5 million have died because of our coronavirus, but 100 million had died in Yates' time for the Spanish flu. So the poem, Second Coming, I recommend you read it. I didn't publish all of it. But this is the point. Go to these things that I write that you find interest. And I don't know how many young people are in the group today. I don't see faces on the screen. But if there's any young teenager or young student, I advise you to go into these things. They're great. So the poem evokes anxiety concerning the social ills of modernity and so on. The next person is this slide that Jeremiah showed. By the way, Jeremiah, thank you. You've done a great job on such short notice. Um, I don't know how you're going to feel after the session. You probably would be a sad case of nerves, but so far you're doing very well. And here's the other poem, you see, that even the title, Wasteland, is... Uh, you know, alludes to death of culture, the misery of being learned in a world that has largely forgotten its roots. So the poem of 434 lines even begins with the recurring imagery of death. T.S. Eliot, this picture you see, made the cacophonies of his generation a music of despair, searching for order in an anarchic world. And there's the poem. Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. So these are what we call, you know, pathos. These are hard poems. They're not sort of cheery ones, all depicting the moment. Next slide. Yeah, the concept of the death of God revived. The concept of death of God comes from Nietzsche of 19th century. But that's the idea that people look at religion as part of the cause of the problem. This was one of their arguments. And this meager historical meditation of ours shows the years of the 20th century engulfed in a background of tradition especially the tradition of God, you see. And the other great uncertainty is the detachment of moral self-determination from revealed religion. In other words, we can define our own morals. We don't need God. Reason will tell me how to act and behave appropriately in a given setting. And this has proved frustrating, of course, but we see that people continue. But one of the things that I write later in the slides is that the first hundred years of the formative age of our faith, the first hundred years of Abdul Baha's passing, has thrown out 200 years of the Enlightenment. Because the Enlightenment, when it came, it was the panacea for everything, that reason, we, with, with science and reason and rational thought, we can clear our problems, even moral problems. And we, we don't need religions. So in the last 100 years, the events have thrown out the last 200 years of the Enlightenment. Next slide. So yeah, the problems are not unrecognizable. The problems we face now at the end of the centenary 
or at the centenary of Abdu'l Baha's passing are daunting. This is no time for epistemological skepticism and political disengagement. We can't go on, in other words, concocting new ideas, having armchair theories on what is human nature, for example, this ep epistemology suggests the origin of new ideas and so on, but there's people are skeptic that what are we gonna find, look for anymore? And people are becoming politically disengaged. It's interesting, but the last elections in the States, if I recall correctly, less than 40% and it's declining of eligible voters voted. People aren't interested in politics. So this political disengagement is a symptom of paralysis. When you're not involved in government, you know, it's, it, it has serious consequences. Government in the widest sense. So there's a fading order and it's twin shadow disorder and past structures are really being challenged now. So we have to, all scenes are to drop at once upon 100,000 stages. In other words, something has to happen. Um, next slide. So you see, at the time of Abdul Baha's passing, things were dire. Now, 100 years later, things are also dire. This is the this perplexed and sorrowful age of Abdul Baha. These are the words of Shoghi Effendi when he described the funeral and so on. But uh, this perplexed world is today met by a world no less disenchanted, which is our world now. John's world, my world, Jeremiah's world, Mr. Hakim's world. The war generation that we talked about 100 years ago, the generation of anger, as it was called, is today the generation of languor, dire and doleful. Languor means we become lazy. We, we become skeptical. We become, well, things are like this anyway. Languor is a nice... Look it up and you'll find that it is that. And pity of war is now pity of lies and lethargies. Comes from another wonderful poet that I like, Auden. He says, all we see are lies. He's referring to leaders and so on. And lethargy. People are skeptical. People are, <clears throat> um, what's the word? Uh, Paralyzed, they don't want to act. They are cynical. Yes, that's the word. Cynicism is our disease today. Oh, Shambos, things won't change. We'll just have to go on. So the idea is here that we cannot, we, we can't even lie still. We can't even sit straight. We can't stand erect, much less kneel and leave, nor do anything but wallow. Yeah, this is from, uh, so there's a contrast between 100 years from that past and 100 years now. It's not too dissimilar. Next slide. And then we go on about nationalism. I don't want to tire you. It's now an, an hour into this. But this is really the biggest uh, problem, you see. Uh, this photo of jingoism 100 years ago is still valid. We're still like a herd instinct following our nations. The nightmare, the nationalism has been described as the nightmare of nations. This is a strong word, friends, because that's, a, that's what's destroying our world. A terrible enemy to civility, another one said. A disease undermining even the best constitutions. And even a bogey. After all, what is a frontier? What is precisely a nation? No one knows. 
And this continues to push the world in territorial expansion, ideological cause, conflict. Yeah, this is the very serious part of our problem. And then someone says, but nation nationalism will always exist. This is where we disagree. A sense of identity among peoples has always been a paramount feature of humanity since the dawn of time. But this inherent need does not necessarily have to translate itself in political statehood. That's the, that's the idea we have to say. And Toynbee, major student of history, well, he was a historian. He wrote his classic six volume study of history, wrote an interesting, he foresaw the European Union. In other words, our cultural identities can continue exist even, even with a universal state, with a larger government. How interesting. So nationalism is not necessarily defined as a definitive thing of our civilization. The European Union is a good example. Universal state can bring with it political unity. It's in the slide, especially after the breakdown of civilization and warfare. Progress and stability can be reinstated by universal state. This is not a Baha'i writing. It's Toynbee, Arnold Toynbee. And um, his, his work is very interesting to read. And he, for, he, he predicted the European Union, EU, before it was formed in the 50s. Next slide. And then we talk about, uh, you can read it on the slide, that we have conquered everything but our nature. The last sentence, while eximious at dealing with non-human nature, we have not been successful at dealing with human nature itself. So this is one of those paradoxes, the contradiction of our civilization. We send men to the moon. We have computers that are thinking like human beings. We have vaccinations in a matter of months. We create wonderful vaccination vaccines. But at human nature, we've, we're way behind. Next slide. And then we wrote something here, Amon. Um, the nature, we are highly materialists, we are, um, we can move to the next slide, this is just saying nicely, the torpor of spirit, torpor is, is sleepiness, people, the spirit is dead, yeah. Now, this is an interesting quotation. by Sartre, father of existentialism. He says, what should we do when everything breaks down? He says, when the instruments are broken and unusable, when plans are blasted out and effort is meaningless, the world appears with a childlike and terrible freshness, suspend practice in a void. This is quoted from a book by Hannah Arendt. It's another great book, but Sartre said it nicely. He said, okay, we don't necessarily, it's not a bad thing to start from zero because like a child, we're open to all wonders. We're open to everything fresh and new. And the Baha'i faith is that, you see. But it's interesting. He says, look, we tried everything. He wrote this in the mid 20th century. Sartre has died since then, Jean-Paul. He says, when the instruments are broken, when plans are useless, 
the world appears with a childlike freshness, suspended in a void. They're waiting for some stimulus. It's amazing. Absolute. Next slide. And this is where Abdu'l Baha comes in. Abdu'l Baha being like the message to this sign of the times. Not just the person, but his message, his figure. As a wise educator and reconciler of the human race, Abdu'l Baha outlives artists, men and women of letters, businessmen, soldiers, and statesmen. As for prophets and saints, Abdu'l Baha outranges them all. This is a really our consolation that God has to create a figure like Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah. And the title of the slide, uh, the apostle of the possible, I, I, I made it up, but listen how Abdul Baha describes himself. When he was given this highly honor, you see it in the slide? This was when he's being knighted. He even received the highest accolade for mortal men, not immortal like him, but mortal men, knighthood, you see. And here you have the day, a few years before he died, he got knighted. He's now Sir Abdul Baha. But this is how he described himself, teacher of God's word. Look at the humility of the man. He didn't say, I'm a leader of the world's largest religion or I'm the center of the covenant or something grandiose like that. He simply says, a modest title chose for himself upon receiving knighthood. This was in 1920. And the garden is the military governor's house in Haifa. And the knighthood was conferred for his recognition of humanitarian work in adverting famine due to blockade caused by the great war between the allies and the central powers. The story of knighthood is very interesting, how he also saved three villages from starvation. Adasiye, near Tiberias. I used to go there as a child. Now it's Jordan, I can't go, but, but anyway, that's the spirit, you see. He's a leader, but a servant leader. He gave himself before this general and the queen of England. He said, I'm the teacher of God's word. Beautiful. Next slide. Yeah, we're the spiritual descendants of Abdul Baha, you see. The calamity becomes more serious when we have we don't act as a new race of man. You see, man is the problem of our time, not problems of individuals. These can fade away. And we may even forbid them. But the problem is man, you see. So if we're uninstructed in his ways, Abdul Baha's ways, or not attracted enough to his person, we will have failed to become the new race of man, you see. His ability to envision alternate human reality is perhaps one of humankind's most precious gifts. Abdul Baha was able to move towards a shared and co-created narrative by a leap of imagination and ecstasis, going beyond oneself, to possess a radical belief in the impossible. His actions and demeanor, Abdul Baha, was the embodiment of a potent mixture of discourses to bear a social critique for the purpose of renewing faith. Character and activity were the impregnable marks of value in his discourse. And then we go on a bit about the what discourse means and its latitude. Next slide. 
I don't want to take up of your time because we're running short, but yes, this is what we read just now. Next slide. Yeah, this course, we use the term pretty freely in the Baha'i community and so on, but it's much more than the use of language in a social context to convey broad historical meaning. It really goes beyond bridging our personal and social worlds and meaningful conversations. Abdul Baha used this course as a means of fellowship. Citizens uniting together in a polis. In the constant interchange of talk, we unite. There's no single voice, but a plurality of voices that lead not to noise, but to anthem. Hand-to-hand -hand peacemaking cannot occur without a narrative exchange or discourse. So the idea of discourse pushed, pushed by and encouraged by the Universal House of Justice many years ago fulfills a fantastic role, but one which leads to fellowship, not an intellectual conversation or silly talk. What did you do yesterday? How are you with your parents? But a bit broader, you see, with these ideas, with these slides. This is what the house wants with our discourse, a narrative exchange, you see. I mean, what is a discourse? If you see a rock in our path, you can see it either as A, an obstacle, B, a weapon, C, a building brick, D, a material for art. So when we meet people, they're like rocks, you see. Strangers, we can treat them either as threatening rock to crash on our heads or a piece of material we can use together to create a new art, new human being. The rock can become that, used in sculpture. And there's a beautiful quote by the Unitarian minister. I don't know if the slide has it. Next slide. Yeah, thank you, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Glean these from the text. It's beautiful work, Jeremiah. And he says exactly in this idea of discourse. He summarizes the way. He says, why to me a stranger unknown, unheard of, should he raise that friendly hand? Why should a stranger come to me and embrace me? And he was referring to Abdul Baha, you see. He here in, in capital H means Abdul Baha. He said, I'm a simple stranger. But why is Abdul Baha raising his friendly hand? And Abdul Baha replies, I cannot tell you. But in all those upon whom I look, I see only my father's face. Beautiful. So we don't have to like people when we come into discourse, but we must love them. You see, there's a difference. Why we love them? Because we see our father's face in every face. This is Abdul Baha's method, you see, in his discourse. Um, and it's working beautifully in Baha'i communities. This new methodology of, of the House of Justice, which is this idea of training and so on, is precisely to go over these obstacles. And it's working. You see this various communities and so on. And what happens when we continue with being full of ourselves? The rock doesn't budge. Look at this other text. It comes from non-Baha'is, but great professors, philosophy and so on. Um, they describe it pretty well. He said, they say, look, when we're full of ourselves, cocksure, arrogant, self-sufficient, and sovereign in our ego world, we cannot hearken to the stranger in others and ourselves. 
Only after a spiritual voiding can we retrieve the secret mystery of things to which we're habitually blind and inattentive. Beautiful. This comes from a book published in 2018, Debating Otherness is the title. So here you see these non-Baha'i leaders of thought are saying exactly what Baha'is are behaving. Don't be cocksure, arrogant. You will, you will destroy the discourse. Only by being a spiritual void. Take out your self. Nafse amare. The insistent self is Abdul Baha's warning. You see, nafse amare in Persian, in Arabic actually, is coming from an Islamic, Islamic term. Nafs, spirit. Amore, insistent. So if we have our insistent self, if we're not void, take out our self, then we have problems. And these people are saying, look, don't be full of yourself. Be open to experience. Embrace the unknown. It's a wonderful, wonderful. Next slide. Yeah, this is exactly what he had the ability to do. He touched the hearts and uh, understood the yearnings of people. And this is what this course should do in our communities. The world doesn't become humane just because it is made of human beings, but only when it becomes the object of this course. Beautiful. So, However deeply things are or bad, however deeply we're touched or not, they become human for us only when we discuss them with our fellows. We humanize the world by speaking of it. This is the idea of the House of Justice and discourse. Anyway, as, how, as, as, as I see it. Next slide. Yeah, this is um, a continuation of what we were saying, um, that we should be open to sacrificing our views on humanity. Avoid conflict, you see, in all dimensions and all levels. It's the most efficient way of living. This is, I've learned in my professional and personal life. Eliminate conflict. Contention begets contentiousness. If you go in a room full of conflict, leave. It just destroys your spirit. If you go in a meeting and there's conflict, leave or change it. I'm not confrontational. This is what I suffer in life. Not that we should be stupid or... But really it gets us nowhere. It just drains our energy. Um at home, at work, in our assembly meetings, avoid conflict. It's the most efficient way, I tell you. Next slide. So Abdul Baha operated in two worlds very quickly, the seen and the unseen, the cognate and the incognate, the sensible and the intelligible. He unified them. He was the great unifier. Just like a scientist who says that for years, millennia, electricity and magnetism were, were treated as separate fields and distinct forces until intuition and insight, like Abdul Baha, told the scientists that, look, it's one electromagnetic force. You see, they're not two sides of sensible and intelligible material, spiritual. These divisions don't exist in Baha'i view. Just as electricity and magnetism are two expressions of the same unified invisible electromagnetic force. Similarly, in the science of love of God, man cannot grasp the essence of divinity, but can, by his reasoning power, 
by observation, by his intuitive faculties, believe in God, discover his bounties. Beautiful. This is from Abdu'l-Baha. And the text is, the text is from Tablet to Dr. Forel, the great scientist. You see how appropriate that quotation is? The original Persian was first published in Cairo, 1922. And this is the translation I took out of Baha'i World, volume 15. But this is Abdu'l-Baha's tablet to Forel, who was a highest scientist, and entomologist. And Abdu'l-Baha used the idea of the science of the love of God, which is actually a term we find in the seven valleys. But, but there we have it. He says, look, Mr. Dr. Forel, August, August Forel, he was Swiss. Don't divide the world into matter and non-matter. It's one of the same thing. Next slide. And then really we talk at length here about the mystery of God, Abdul Baha's complex figure. It's, it's another, really, it's another presentation. I wouldn't tire you now, but it's a beautiful chapter that we can look into it later on. What is human perfection? He was neither illusion nor fiction, but truth. Incarnation of the ideal man. Yeah, he was a mystery of God. You see that this term mystery of God, Baha'u'llah bestowed upon Abdul Baha, that you can't understand him. All that we've said all along in this last hour hasn't really touched the deep kernel aspect of his being. I mean, what is he? He's not a prophet, but he acts like one. He's not a messenger of God, but he consumes us with the power of a messenger. So how are to infer the appellation mystery of God? Because he commingled, he connected, he compenetrated with the author of Revelation, Baha'u'llah. How do you describe that? Father and son, son and father. You know, there's a beautiful statement by Christ, Jesus Christ, in John's gospel, where he says, is John chapter 14, he says, I am in the Father, and the Father in me. How cute can you dissociate Abdul Baha from Baha'u'llah? Impossible. But he's not Baha'u'llah, he's not the Father. He's not a manifestation of God, but he's his son. Yeah, it's a very fascinating and touching thing. But um, And then there's a bit about Thomas Aquinas, how he describes this concept of father, son. It's a beautiful thing. We won't go into it because of time. We're now close to an hour and 10 minutes. I would like to leave some things for questions and answers, but let's move to the next slide. Although John told me a few weeks ago, you have an hour and a half, but I think we can't, we can't um, exaggerate. And really, how are we to describe Abdul Baha? I thought that really the them is the only thing that can exp explain Abdul Baha. Thraldom is exactly that. He, he thrived in thraldom, Abdul Baha. This is how he was different from us. And here we talk about thraldom, where he says, I'm captive in the hands of God, captive in thy hand. Gives the idea of adherence to the absolute. And um, Yeah, the text says it on the slide. It is, while we're giving our things up, we're actually gaining things, you see. The amputation from things, but which anticipate the possibility of reattachment. 
It's a wonderful idea. So thraldom, the idea of being captive, you see. Thraldom is meaning enslaved, another word for it. It's a unifying power, a centrifugal force, a master condition. And then we describe it a bit. It's a beautiful concept. But this is what distinguishes Abdu'l-Bahá from all other creatures, his total captivity to the will of God and to his cause and so on. And he uses the word captive in thy hand. It's in the tablet of visitation. We read it. We shall be reading it in three weeks' time when we meet for the centenary celebration. Next slide. Yes, this is the full text, you see. Thrall them to the blessed perfection as my glorious refulgent diadem and servitude to all the human race, my perpetual religion. No name, no title. No commendation have I, nor will I ever have, except Abdul Maha. What more can you want? Next slide. Yeah, and then we talk about that, why it's so difficult to explicate. Next slide. And we talk about this. Next slide. So now we're in the hundredth year of the formative age of the Baha'i era. So you see, it's auspicious date this year, not just because it's 100 years after the passing of Abdu'l-Bahá, but it's 100 years of our formative period. Abdu'l-Bahá closed the heroic age of the faith. But he's with us in this formative period precisely because of, here I mentioned one, but two charters that is governing our administration and work. You see, we're four charters in the Baha'i faith that are very important to understand. We have the Charter of World Civilization, which is the Book of Agdas, the most holy book of laws, penned by Baha'u'llah. So that's the Charter of a World Civilization. Everything is in that book on how we must comport ourselves, how we must organize society, how we should do things, establish assemblies and so on. The other charter, Baha'u'llah, is the Tablet of Carmel, which delineates, outlines how the world center is developing and why it's blessed. Very two powerful charters. Tablet of Carmel and Book of Abbas. But the other two charters come from his son, Abdul Baha. Yeah, they share, you see. The father and son concept. The father and son share equally the impact of their charters. Abdul Baha wrote this will and testaments on the slide. Why is it important? Because it reaffirms the spiritual principles and in enumerated new institutions like the National Assembly, how we should make elections, the guardianship, huge. All in the will and testament of the boss. So here we have the charter of the Baha'i administration. And the other charter, which Abdul Baha is governing our activities of the tablets of the divine plan, which is how the teacher, Baha'i teacher, should comport himself where we should teach, how we should do it. The tablets of the divine plan is a charter for the spiritual conquest of the planet. Anyway, I'm, I'm going off track, but you see, the formative period has Abdul Baha with us because he talks about the guardianship, the national assemblies, about Baha'i consultation, tons of material are um, involved in this period. Next slide.
yeah, this reads well. The slide says it all that uh, humanity has the reason, volition, and conscience to do things, but it needs inspired guidance. It needs to unify the two things. You can have an intelligent child, but if he's not guided, you lose that intelligence, you see. And if you have two children and the family is not united, whatever you teach, you don't create a complete human being. So the idea of guidance and unification is what we Baha'is are trying to do, you see. The genuine love of humanity is the first step. It's the best hope because there's divine grace in it. This is important. Hope without divine grace is a promise unfulfilled. And we need the humility to have to empty self and move to the nafsa mutma'enne, which is the Arabic opposite of nafsa ammare. Nafsa mutma'enne means the selfless soul, the assured soul, the submissive soul. This is the idea, you see. We should move from one to the other. Next slide. This is Jeremiah's imagination. <laughs> but it works well. Here is talking about milk and honey. Um, and why do we talk about milk and honey? Because there's a small reference of milk and honey in the text. And he did a good job. Um, the paradise of milk and honey, which human beings have dreamed of, a land of perpetual peace and abundance, belongs in religion and mythology and not history or science. So, you know, the Hebrews, the, ever since beginning of time, the ideal society was one, there's plenty of milk and honey. Even Rousseau says that egalitarian society is possible. Marx and Engel, Engels, in their theory of primitive communism, they believed in recreating a higher order. So you see, here we have the spirit of the thing to, to do things, to do amazing things. But then, you know, what are the cycles that we must go through and so on? But that's the idea of this slide. Next one. Yeah, we talk about civilizations and why they break down and so on. And there's reference to Toynbee that we won't go into. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, this is uh, really to show us that the motive of human action is love of the world. As Abdu Baha did it. He, the appearance of Abdu Baha, the most perfect bounty, this most great favor conferred upon men, provides an important and necessary function, that of incarnating the ideal, that it's possible for human beings to be different. Be as I am. Be as I am. And that slide earlier that we rushed over it was that text of his. Look at me, follow me, be as I am. It's a beautiful text. Uh, maybe we should look at it. Look, Go back, please, Jeremy. This time we're going back, not forward. Yes. It says it all, you see. It says, be as I am, not as if. He's not saying, look at me as fictional, as though things could be, but as they are. The word as is very strong. It's not as if, you see. Be as I am. Take no thought for yourselves or your lives, whether you eat, sleep, comfortable, well or ill, whether you're friends and foes, whether you receive praise or blame, for all things... 
For all these things, you must care not at all. Look at me, be as I am. You must die to yourselves and to the world. So you shall be born again and enter the kingdom of heaven. Behold the candle, how it gives light, weeps life away drop by drop. This is the beautiful song by Seals and Crofts. Behold the candle. And so on. That, um, they took it from here, you see. This is one of the texts that is very moving. And uh, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, this is the last slide, you see. The centenary of the passing of Abdul Baha discloses once and for all his era defining odyssey. Ekke Omo, a last living prose which God wrote for the signature of things. The world to which we must return can never really be the same. But the healing is one day at a time, never once and for all. Little by little, day by day is Abdul Baha's counsel. How to attain the promise of a new surplus, a new fulfilling. But while life has no end, it has a definite beginning. And we must make sure that the good our hands do exceeds what the body may rest and not succumb to it. The idea being here, we chase after livelihood, money, shopping, just to exist. No, we should look after what good our hands can do. And then we write, there's no high road to Damascus, but nor is it a lost armada. From Abdul Baha's immense and beautified handwork, there's a first lesson to be learned. To avoid the disintegration of the world and the dissolution of those values. And what is this first lesson? To be a true agent for change, we must move incessantly between pragmatic, lasting altruism and self-effacement. These characterize the interiority and grandeur of human agency. Otherwise, we shall continue to polish imaginary fragments shored against our ruins. Thank you, dear friends. So we have room for questions. Um, we'll take the first two questions we have because yes, we did start late, but it's also after 1230. So we have room for two questions and then we will be uh, concluding our beautiful session today. There you are. <laughs> so there is one question about this last passage you just made about the Baha'i world, the, the passage from the Baha'i world. Uh, this passage where, uh, if we could pull it up, Jeremiah, if you wouldn't mind. It would, it would be best that people can see it. Could you elaborate on that first sentence, this Eke Homo? Yes, this, is, this comes from a book by another philosopher, This Man, or Behold Man, which, um, um, which philosophers use to the fact that man can be as much an apex of creation as it can be an animal. So Behold Man is... Uh, is a poetic way of saying ecke homo, meaning um, the potential that is man, the fruit that is man, and uh, behold man is the translation. So there's another question, and this question is about how to contact you and how to, for example, get a copy of your slides and whatnot. So the question is, uh, first, what is your contact? How can people contact you if they want okay, to? Okay, good point. 
we didn't make a slide of my email um, because I'm here to assist with anything, any inquiry or even material you may need, where my sources are. But um, I'll give you my personal email, um, not the prof uh, business email. And that is my first name, Shahbaz, mm -hmm. dot F, letter F, minuscule, small caps, five, six, all together, at gmail.com. So it's Shahbaz, point, Shahbaz, dot F, five, six, at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so it's S H A H. B A Z Shahbaz yes. dot or period F as in Foxtrot five six at gmail.com. Thank you for that. And uh, Dana also had a question. This was earlier. I'm sorry, Dana. Uh, this question was Could you please tell us the three generations that Abdul Baha stood at the confluence at? The three generations she's asking from earlier. Yeah, the three lost generations we began our talk with those three lost generations, um, which began with the ministry, which were covered by the ministry of Abdul Baha. So the first generation were people who went to World War I in their 20s, you see, the massacre and the slaughter. So it's a lost generation, millions died. The second generation was born 10 years later and they met with Tremendous economic volatility and instability in the world um, and revolutions, the Russian revolutions and so on. And the third lost generation was born 10 years after and it took them to World War II, the Nazi concentration camps, the atomic bomb. Really, it's three generations of that we lost and that's very sad. And the Ministry of Abdul Baha covered literally uh, the darkest period, I guess, in, um, in our history. Hopefully that uh, answered your question and also those of you who had this similar question. Now, there is, there is another question that is asked and I'm going to ask the person who asked this question, although it would have been great for this presentation, that we email again uh, this email, which is Shahbaz, S-H-A-H, -H, like the Shah of Iran, Shah, Shahbaz, B-A-Z, dot F-56 at gmail.com. Shahbaz dot F-56 at gmail.com. And uh, also you can contact the Clearwater Baha'is on the website and we can get you connected if you have trouble. So we are more than happy to assist. Uh, there was a question uh, asking for the PowerPoint. I provided that person, I typed it in to the chat here as well for that person to directly email you asking for the PowerPoint. Actually, you know what? Jeremiah has it. So uh, please also email Clearwater Baha'is. <laughs> yes, that will be uh, admin at clearwaterbaha'is.org. So that all being said, we want to thank you so much on behalf of the community here and those of us joining for making this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Fathi Azam, for being here with us today. Of course, writing those books that you've written and which people can find online. Uh, it's a, a very, very nice thing. I found it also for free online. But of course, if you love the book, buy a copy of it so you can have a physical copy, not just something online that could disappear tomorrow. <laughs> that being said, um, thank you again. We appreciate it for future talks. Please go to cluewaterbahais.org for this talk. If you want to find it on YouTube and Facebook, it's on the Facebook page for the Baha'i Center of Clearwater and on Clearwater Baha'is, the YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone. And have a beautiful, beautiful celebration of the birth of Baha'u'llah.